Hello, I'm FPX Toy Cat, and if you don't like the terrain in your Minecraft world, you don't have to put up with it or start a brand new world because instead you can just change it. Even though a biome will always stay the same underneath all of this, you can change the surface terrain to make somewhere look much more interesting. Today, in fact, I'll be going through five such examples. I'll be starting with the easiest one to do in a world and then working up to the hardest uh, and the most involved ones that I think have the highest results. And just as a spoiler alert, this is partly inspired from a recent video I did about parity where I loved the combination of cherry trees and mycelium so much that I decided to do it here. And so that is one of the five that you'll be seeing after we jump into the first one because this savanna is just too big. It's savanna into desert, into savanna, into desert, into even beaches over here. I feel like this area could be perfect for five biomes that all meet in one point, right where that drowned with the trident is, which is a good reminder I should go to sleep and then show you the first of the five biomes. My plan was to sleep in the nearby cherry mansion that I built, but I can't can't remember where I put the bed in here, so I guess maybe I'll just stay up all night. Okay, there we go. The bed has now been slept in and I am ready to do some morning activities, which involves creating a whole new biome. So, for the easiest version of this, I think it's easy to show how you could terraform something massively, but if you're just going for a low resource, make your endless savanna look more interesting, or your endless plains, or whatever biome you have too much of in your world, I think as long as it uses grass, one of the easiest things you can do to change the entire profile of a biome from this ugly, you know, very much overheated grass into something more interesting is using a shovel and simply placing down some dirt path. I recommend using a bucket of water first to remove all of the uh, unnecessary grass, but if you do this, then you'll end up with a biome which looks entirely different. One of the fun facts about uh, pathway blocks is they do look the same in every single biome, which means that you can have a fairly homogenous looking biome, even if lots of them intersect here, or if the opposite happens, you have one that stretches on for far too long. So now what we have to do is just take any shovel, again, it, it, they all work exactly the same, they all shovel instantly, so you shouldn't use your best shovel if you're worried about keeping it alive, but use this shovel and just take every block in a certain area and cover it in this dirt path. Oh, and fun fact about these dirt path blocks we're making, you can see right here that dirt path is not quite a full block. It's very slightly less than one, and this makes no difference for most of your world, but if there isn't a block below the one that you're mining, you have these incredibly small gaps, and I think these are just incredibly weird things to look at. They might be useful to you, but they're very weird regardless, and the other thing that's worth keeping in mind is if you do think that the dirt path is maybe a little bit too samey, something you might prefer doing instead is getting some regular dirt blocks, because Dirt has a very much similar look, but if you want to make sure uh, that the dirt doesn't turn into grass again, a very annoying problem, all you have to do is combine it in your crafting table with some gravel, and then you get coarse dirt, which can never be turned right back. This means you can have a slightly different looking uh, dirt too, because just to show you the difference here, this is dirt right there, and this is coarse dirt. It is very slightly different, but it does give people the vibe that you really care about a thing. Also, wow, you know, very, very rude of you. But interesting, interesting point there is that you can do this, and so this is something I'm going to be mixing into the biome here and there because I do think that having some coarse dirt is a nice breakup from what we're seeing over here. It's so much faster to place these once you've cleared out somewhere of water by the way because having none of these seeds in your way means all you've got to do is go for lovely sprints in lines which is why I recommend bringing a water bucket for anything like this. It really does remind me of super flat more than anything else which by the way I I, I, I you know I, I've had this like real excitement about playing like a hardcore world one of those weird ends for a while and I'm torn now about like whether super flat or whether uh, that should bring my interest. But I think the one thing that you should always remember is if you're torn about what new world to start, it's always important that your existing world is where your attention is most needed. And I love how almost immediately after doing this, I start to realize some things I didn't realize I liked. Like, I love the way this sand is just slightly taller than the pathway blocks I have here. It actually makes the biome transition much more interesting than it was before. I like seeing the coarse dirt do a very similar thing. It adds just a tiny bit of life to the biome and makes it feel a bit more like a old growth savanna biome, you know, like kind of like a mega tiger, but it's that for savanna. I like the combination. I think it's very fun. And I think this is a good first biome that we just need to finish off before moving to the second one. But something you might prefer if you like the opposite vibe, and it's very weird to do the opposite here, uh, but this is a beach biome right over here, which means it's actually great to place our grass. I do think that grass looks better, the greener it is. I know what a crazy opinion I have, which means if you place some grass down and then some dirt to connect it, we can make this whole island that is currently just yellow and boring into something which is much more larger and interesting. However, this isn't really making a new biome, you're just kind of turning an island into a plains, so what do we do for that? The answer is given to you by the sniffer, actually. Oh dear god. <laughs> 
I was trying to shut my windows because it started raining, but you had to ruin that with all of the bamboo you definitely stole from me. How much bamboo was he holding? 40 bamboo, Jesus. How does that even happen? Anyway, so I'm gonna get myself some torch flower seeds and then something else to give it a bit of color. I think some orange tulips should do quite nicely. Although we'll leave a few in here. Step one is simple. Cover the island in grass. Step two is to take our much better looking island. Seriously, do you see the improvement? I know I do, but the important thing is to take a look at this and then place some colorful plants. I think a nice green biome is wonderful by itself, but in the same way a sunflower plains is so much better than one of these, what if we could improve upon one of these? Well, simply put, that's what we're gonna do. I think it's kind of annoying that torch flowers are gonna plant like this, but we'll just apply, uh, you know, place them kind of haphazardly around the island, just like so, maybe even especially on these uh, dirt patch. And uh, then we're gonna go ahead and have a bunch of ready to grow orange beautiful stuff. Also, that is the first time I planted a sniffer seed on uh, this version of Minecraft. How fun. Anyway, so with that said, uh, <laughs> you know, isn't it weird? They came out forever ago. This is my first time needing to use one. But the other weird thing is if you need to grow these quickly, you can use bone meal. That's one way to speed up growth of things. The other way, if you ever need to grow something quickly, is just grow a bunch of them, and eventually one of them will work. It is a random one in, say, a thousand chance that every, uh, you know, like every single tick, one of these will happen. However, if you have 20 chances, you increase your odds. I think this is my advice for anything that has like an element of luck to it, is you can spend all day waiting around for luck that you're not actively applying for, and you can also spend all day applying for luck and it go nowhere, but um, ultimately the, you know, the you, if you increase your odds, it's always going to give you better odds, and in life you should always be trying to increase those odds. But for now, let's just place some orange tulips around and then see if we can't make a beautiful orange biome with a little bit of waiting. You know, actually, while we do the waiting, let's move to the third biome. <laughs> you know, I, I want to show you what this looks like when it's done, but I feel like we could spend a bunch of bone meal, which is best done by waiting on something else. Lots of things in life take time. You know, I, I'm certainly learning that from my past week. So let's work on something else, which finally gets me to use my gravel. So this island has the exact same problem as uh, this current one, which is just that it's another generic tiny beach island. I don't feel it needs to be too interesting. So what if we made it gravel based? And that is indeed my goal. Um, but yeah, I've been uh, spending a lot of time this week working on changing my locks. I It's not like it's something that's particularly important, but someone from uh, the place where I bought my house just came around and they're like, oh yes, I am here to take photographs. And it's like, no, you are not here. He, he, he was he went, he went got the wrong like street address, but it's still wild that someone came around to my house of keys. And it was like a reminder, like people, like, uh, my, my house used to be rented out to like individuals. It's called HMO in the UK, if you know what I'm talking about. But uh, basically like there are probably dozens of people who have a copy of my key or or have had a copy of my key, and whenever you move into a house, you're meant to change the locks, but I just figured, like, uh, how important really is it? Like, everyone who has had a key that showed up is not nicely, so, you know, is it really gonna change something? But I decided to, especially after my recent uh, <laughs> uh, house uh, lodger situations, uh, after having people uh, live here, I was like, let's just change the lock, and I, I was going to do it, but it's been on the to-do list forever, but then this past week, I realized that someone came into the house in a genuinely non-malicious way, but it was kind of scary, like, he managed to to open the door and he's like, yeah, this is the, the key for the place. And it's wild that like, yeah, a lot of people who say that they have given back a key don't necessarily do so. And it was like the true reminder that like, yeah, if I, if I wasn't home, this guy would have gone gone and taken photographs of the entire place. And again, it's, it's not even like that's such a bad thing. It's just a reminder that someone just has to have the tiniest bit of ill intent mixed with one of these things and it gets real bad. So I decided like, okay, someone, someone ended my house without permission. I should change the locks. And I've been really, you know, one of the, things that people will tell you. Like, a lot of people shame you if you're not... Ri this is the thing that's scary about being an adult. People shame you for not having random talents that no one should be expected to have. So I, uh, I described something as a uh, an S-Bend in one of my bathrooms, and someone's like, Toy Cat, that's a, that's a P-Trap, it's not an S-Bend. And it's like, I'm sorry, I don't know how the plumbing works. Or, you know, some people are like, oh, yeah, man, I can't believe you hired someone to uh, hook up a washing machine. You know how easy that is to do yourself? Like, people, people love to tell you, like, wow, yeah, you could totally do this thing if you just learn the skill. And so I decided, because I've heard that changing a lock is one of those things everyone thinks is really complex, but you just, you know, like you hire a locksmith, you pay a hundred, uh, and the, it, last time I changed my locks, it cost 80 pounds, and that was a cash in hand, the guy didn't pay tax discount. So like a hundred plus pounds just to change a lock, I've decided to do it myself and figure, you know what, uh, this, this is a real, easy task that you can get done. You just have to, uh, you know, like, uh, learn how to do it. It takes, like, 10 minutes. You unscrew some things, you put the new thing in, and it's great. However, 
again, I, I would like to be, I think someone should do the PSA for why every service isn't worth paying for as well. Like, a lot of people uh, think going to a restaurant is a waste of money because, yeah, when you cook at home, it costs like 10 times less. The, the ingredient cost of being at a restaurant is never the same, but you're paying uh, for lots of other factors in it, like the skill of uh, years of knowledge, etc. And the same is true, I think, for a locksmith. After having tried to do it myself, I realized first things first, every guide on how to change your lock, for some reason, isn't about how to change your lock, as you might expect. It's actually about how to uh, change your entire door locking mechanism. So uh, that's that's like, uh, you know, if you want to change that, it costs like 60, 70 pounds, and you're most of the way to a price for locksmith. You want to change the rim cylinder inside your lock. If anyone is watching this and needs to change a lock, you know, hopefully this is useful. Um, but yeah, so you, you need to change a component that costs five times less. That's really easy and really, but I, I went all the way to a store to realize that and then, okay, that's fine. I also realized that only certain rim cylinders are compatible with other ones. You need to know the company that makes your current one so you can get the same design from them again with the same certifications because it does affect, it, it, it affects your insurance if you get different ones. So uh, you want to go ahead and you want to make sure you find the same company. I think Yale makes basically every lock in the world. And if the last people who installed your lock happen to not use Yale, maybe you're in for some trouble. So anyway, with that said, um, you, there's like all these tiny things that no one tells you about because they assume it won't come up, but it totally does. And then I finally, I, I, I've got the new lock in hand. I've spent like hours researching, getting this done. Uh, it's, I'm ready to do it. And then all of a sudden the lock, I don't know what it's even called, the lock, uh, the, the big thing that goes from the key to the actual unlocking mechanism, that is slightly too long. And it's like, oh yeah, so you just have to snap this off at a particular thing. You have to get it exactly down, by the way, to 1.2 centimeters, 120 millimeters. Mine was down at like 180 after I snapped it. So I tried again and I over snapped and now, ah oh, man, we gotta, gotta order a whole nother lock because this one is genuinely worthless unless you're willing to like extend that using some copper cake. Basically what I'm saying is there are so many steps and I've spent hours working on something and on an objective level, uh, you know, like uh, some people would say 100 pounds is so much for someone just to come and do a thing. Um, but if you think about how much you would charge to go and do a thing at random strangers houses who are going to be really mad at you because they've just got something to do, I think 100 pounds is uh, pretty decent or maybe we'd all be locksmiths. Um, like I, I think that's the same for basically any skill you try to learn yourself. You appreciate why other people are able to charge for it, which I think is the real value in me having tried to change my lock this week. And uh, yeah, maybe that's what I'm learning as I put these biomes together. Man, Minecraft sure does this a lot easier and better. Um, if you're curious, by the way, this is going to be a big gravel biome, not just for the sake of being like a gravel beach, but instead to kind of fit my uh, fun idea that I've had for a while, which is using all of my deep slate and my gravel, something that you know I've been trying to do recently. I've just got far too much of both. It's using up so many shulker boxes, so I'm going to deliberately use up all of this that I can to do other things. But yeah, um, to kind of vaguely finish my story, I just want to say um, the after so much time spent, I think you have to come to either realize that your time has a value, and if you don't like doing something, it might be worth paying someone else to do the same thing, if you can. And the other thing is to say that actually, you've got to treat things like this as a really cool learning opportunity, because there are so many things that you're surrounded by on a day-to-day -day basis that you have no clue how they work until they break and you have to fix them. And so after like putting together this lock, I'm like, oh, I understand how door locks work. It's, it's like actually, it's such a really simple mechanism that is installed in such a way to make it so hard to detect from the outside and so hard to like, you know, break for someone who's not a lockpick. You know, it's, it's, it's something that I think is real fun. Anyway, I'm gonna go murder these guys, get to sleep, and then start working on the mushrooms, I guess. By the way, Torchflower Island is panning out nicely, just needs a little bit more time, and then we'll be in a beautiful place. Also, why- I feel like I've seen torch flowers on the ground without having to have the, the ugly grass below them. Is that what happens when they're done, or...? You know, we'll find out, won't we? So, uh, again, I've never actually grown torch flowers. I've placed them, I've gone all the seeds, I've used pitcher plots all the way, as you saw earlier, just never with the, uh, the torch flower, apparently. Oh, and this is definitely the biggest of the custom biomes so far, by the way, and that is 100% by design. You know, great way to get rid of all of this gravel, and soon to be all of this deep slate too, because get this, it's not just a great base for an island. I think it actually would be kind of ugly if you just use it as a base, because we'll also be using it to, in my opinion, kind of funnily, uh, make some mushrooms on top of this. We could use the mushrooms just like so, uh, make the exact same design that the game uses, but like, you know, out of cobbled deep slate, or not cobbled deep slate, but smooth deep slate and so that should give us a fairly fun little design that looks something like that. We jump down and we go, ooh, isn't my mushroom looking good? I think maybe you need to fill in the corners right here and uh, then you end up with a very monochromatic looking, oh wait, there's another block that goes out over here, right? 
Yeah, I don't I don't know what I did differently here, but okay, we'll place blocks there and then over there and yeah, you know, this looks great. This is exactly how mushrooms are meant to look. Let's maybe just pretend that we didn't do that. And so, yeah, we get kind of a monochromatic biome, which is a great contrast to all of the color that is slowly popping up behind me. And so now let's continue this monochrome with all of the gravel and deep slate possible. I'm honestly not sure which of these free mushrooms I like better, but I do like that they all look like they're very fossilized in a gross kind of old way, which is exactly what we want when we're using deep slate in this level and quantity. And again, it's uh, all just happening while something else happens in the background. But yeah, the, the whole tale of the locksmith was really a reminder of like, uh, one is the value that you get from everyone else in society every single day. I think so many people are easy to forget like things that you rely on other people for um, to some extent. Like, oh yeah, the, the the whole world systems only exist when someone's out to get you. You know, like uh, people, people are never out to do nice things for you. There are things that like are being done for you, even if it is in exchange for monetary compensation that are so huge on such a, regular basis just to keep the world running. Uh, so I think that's an interesting point. But I think the other uh, much more interesting part of it is that basically any time you're doing something in life, you'll have a really bad time if you see it as really boring task work and you hate it and you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. Um, like stuff that you don't want to do that's dull is, you know, obviously going to be harder to convince yourself to do, which is why I always recommend like when you're doing something like this, which is like, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you try to treat learning to uh, install a washing machine or learning to change your own lock as a task It's a really frustrating task because you don't know your way through it when you're doing something for the first time You have to come in with that learning mindset. Of, oh, how does this work? I bet there's some interesting stuff below that um, And I think if you do that you'll come into stuff much much better off. I've uh, you know, honestly uh, Maybe uh, you know to, to admit something kind of personal here I've kind of had to take this tack when I do tutorial focused Minecraft videos I feel like I used to know more than near anyone about Minecraft Minecraft. I was very obsessed with the game uh, and knew like an insane amount in 2014 and you know I always keep up my Minecraft knowledge as updates go through but every now and then there's something that changes that I don't remember or don't you know I forget about or whatever the case may be but over the course of time it means that my knowledge can get a little bit outdated so whenever I'm making a new video I want to make sure it's as accurate as possible that's incredibly important to me um, so I have to do like a, a, a research phase and it can be like really frustrating to be like oh, can I just can I just get past this and get to the bits that I enjoy already, but instead I try to see it as, oh yeah, this is fun, I'm learning more about Minecraft. I, I learn all sorts of weird things every single day this way, and it makes it like actually exciting. Like, I learn this thing that's not relevant for this video, but it might be for another one. I learn this thing that's not relevant for any video, but inspires me to make a weird Minecraft build, and uh, those are the sorts of things that I really enjoy. Kind of like uh, while I was, by the way, this is my gravel mount. I think I need to maybe put in some more deep state mushrooms, but the fourth biome idea is going to be on the hardest scale because it is the one that a lot of people said that they liked as well. We're going to do it out of nowhere in the ocean and we're going to make sure we have a gap between each of these biomes uh, just so we can ride boats through them still in my opinion. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to stack some gravel up from like over here and we'll start the biome right there. So the idea behind this biome is really simple. Mycelium and cherry trees look really good together. And so what do we do? We take some mycelium, we take some cherry trees and you're going to you're going to love this next step. We combine them together. This is, uh, th this really is that just like looking at something and seeing inspiration thing. But by placing just four cherry trees here, we'll place them slightly offset, I think. So we'll place this one over like there. Um, we'll place four cherry trees down and then we should end up with a very beautiful biome, which I'll of course come back to when it's not so dark and tragic here. Okay, so now we have the very rough layout for our island, leaving a nice channel over here to get through, a nice one over here, and now if we want to expand it, we can obviously go forwards and backwards a little bit. We kind of probably could do that on the back, but the front is nicely curved in, so we'll deliberately place our blocks back here. However, it does leave you with one problem when you make an island from thin air, uh, rather than terraform an existing one, which is obviously there is this big gap underneath it. It blew my mind when I learned. I was depressingly late in my life, like, like 15 or 16. I was like, wait, islands aren't literally floating? And it's like, yeah, no, islands are obviously real land masses connected to the bottom of the world. And so, oh, very beautiful. And the crazy thing about that is it means that you have to connect down. You can't have a random floating piece of land and call it an island. 
How do we solve this? The way we solve all of our problems lately. That's right, it's Deep Slay. I feel like this is basically the equivalent of using stone, except I have far too much of this type of stone, and so let's see how this is pulled off when we do it. The answer is very poorly because there are so many drowns down here. I'm also realizing as I'm placing these, actually, this isn't how an island actually works. It kind of comes out in a slightly more cascading way. And so what I need to do is I need to start one block further out. So I need to start something like over here. And then if I want, I can bring it out further. Or if I want to do kind of like deliberately making a point about how this is uh, fake terrain, I could go down from here, but it's important to do it one block further forward. So there's this tiny bit of shore rather than this where it looks like it's actively a monstrosity uh, that is being built from nowhere. I do like the monstrosity vibes, I just want it to be clearly a monstrosity of an island, not a monstrosity of a floating mycelium, because this is too beautiful of a biome to waste on something like that. And so yeah, we go around the entire island, maybe best to do it from the surface actually, and we just make a little shore out of deep slate. I am gonna take this occasion just to make the island a little bit thicker. I like the size of it for me, but I don't think it's really a biome, it's more of a quirky island. So we need to give it just a little bit more heft on the rear size, as I'm sure lots of people already feel, but I think it's important we do that just to give it a little bit more of something. So we'll connect this up over there, just make another little raised island. I think just these tiny little details go a a long way into making the place feel a little bit more alive, a little bit more like a biome full of stuff than like a random island full of stuff, which is a goal that it's important we aim for because the title says biomes and you know, the one guy is gonna leave a comment and we can't, we can't <laughs> have that one guy be disappointed. I don't know who the one guy is yet, but we all know the one guy, right? There's always, there's always the one person who misses your entire point when you're saying something and gets you on a technicality and it's like, but surely you understand that the point I was raising was this. And it's like, well, you know, I, I, I understand that you're talking about P-traps and S-bends, Toy Cat, but actually it's you bet, you traps and P-bends, you, you idiot. <laughs> but I, I, I kind of, I, I think that's one of the, the, the most interesting things about human humanity is how we have this like instinctive desire to correct people more than we do to help people. I feel like if you want to get a locksmith's advice, you don't say, oh man, I'm having real problems with my lock. Like I, I snapped the thing off slightly too short and it's like, it's like one centimeter too short now. Rather than saying that and being like, I'm in such a bind, people who are distressed tend to be less fun than people who are confidently wrong getting proven wrong. So what I instead say is, yeah, so I've got a, uh, I've got this thing. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't protrude from the door at all, but I'm convinced it'll work if I just, uh, if I really try hard enough, and so I'm gonna keep on just jiggling it over and over again. If any locksmiths were watching this, they would agree with how right I am, of course. Although, if I was wrong, I'm sure they could let me know down below. There we go, that's, uh, got it sorted. In the same way, I don't know, I feel like, uh, I get so many YouTube comments, but the, the ones that compel me most are when people are so d ridiculously wrong on so many levels about so much in Minecraft that's like, you, it's th someone needs to correct this just on a, a public service information front. Like, uh, it's it's crazy, how, you, you know, the sugarcane myth I mention all the time because all day, every day, someone is saying that to someone else. Like, yeah, I heard once this piece of information. False information can tread, spread just as fast as real information because it's at some point, the thing that affects whether you believe something is true or false is not how true or false it is, it's how confidently people say it. I saw a video of someone being like, did you know glasses uh, are actually fake? You can live life without them. They are actually, you know, you're only, you only stop being able to see as well without them after you wear them. And it's like, man, this person is so confident about what they're saying. They could use this to spread some real good information, but instead they're just really confidently incorrect. And uh, yeah, I feel like that's a common problem that I've seen at least. Maybe it is just what I have seen. But yeah, this island is coming together nicely. But once we finish this, you're going to notice something interesting, which is there's going to be a void under the island. Underneath this island right here, even though there's a big uh, stone mountain leading up to it, there's not going to be a void down there because it's all filled in. There is no real reason for me to fill this in once we're done, right? Like, do you see what I mean? There's going to be this whole submerged structure that's going to be inaccessible. I could leave it filling with fish and drowns and all the other sorts of things that maybe you don't want in the ocean, or maybe I could bring some sponges with me and I could decide to do something a little bit silly and I could slowly drain this with all of the, from all of the water, which is currently filling it. This would allow me to do a few silly things, to be totally honest, uh, but it would give me a giant void space under this island. Do I want that? Apparently so. <laughs>
If only because it helps me to actually build this. I mean, the amount of oxygen we're depleting, uh, just it's, it makes sense to have some easy oxygen underneath the structure that we're building. Also, you are going to get hit by drowns so many times building underwater. Every time I do a project here, I'm like, oh yeah, Minecraft actively doesn't want you to build in the ocean. It's got the only hostile mob that spawns there 24-7, I guess besides the never maybe. It really is like a whole new dimension of the game in terms of the challenge that it presents. There we go, another one. Wow, look at that. It's happened again. And uh, the fact that some of them can basically one-hit KO you if you're not careful, it's something you got to watch out for. And look at that. We got another one over here too. So, um, yeah, I'm going to use some of this airspace to place some torches just to make it a little bit less depressing. And then we're going to make something fun down here after we place a lot more cobble deep slate. That took longer than expected, but now we have this magic void space. We just have to see how many sponges it'll take. Fortunately, I raided I, I raided enough ocean monuments to get a thousand sponges a long time ago, specifically because I have a penchant for silly projects that involve replacing blocks that exist already. And so, yeah, I can basically just place the sponges all around until eventually the water goes away. There are more methodical ways of doing this, but they generally take more time. I've yet to find one that is more consistent and actually faster uh, than this. So you just kind of go around, goofing around with a bunch of blocks, and then we go in and get this. I think it is important to mention, we do have to regularly break the wet sponges, or they'll be trapped up, because you can swim through water, but you can't swim through air. That is a, maybe a, a valuable life lesson, unless you're an astronaut. Although, you know, I, I've been playing a bit of a, a bit of Starfield this week, so I feel like I'm an astronaut. I, I do have to say, I have, uh, you know, like, <laughs> an example of something where, like, uh, you know, it feels like a real task to get into are certain MMORPGs. Like, it, it, people don't like to admit this, like, we like to pretend all games are fun, but some games have such long learning curves that you're not going to be having fun while you do it. So, Baby Drowned, by the way. Uh, there, there are some games that have such steep learning curves where it's like, you just have to admit to yourself, yeah, this doesn't get fun for a little bit, but when it gets fun, it gets really fun, trust me. And that's that's kind of a wild thing. Starfield is one of those great examples of it. It's a Bethesda game where just to understand the like basics of what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you get around, because everything is fast travel in, in, uh, in, in, in Starfield. It's the only realistic way you would do basically anything. And so, um, also man, this is, this is very inefficient, I have to say. The water just does not want to go away. Um, but there's, there's so many, there's so many activities in that game where it's just like, yeah, do this, trust us, you're gonna want to do it. And there's no real explanation beyond just like, you, you'll get it eventually, but once you do get it, it's great. There's so many, they, they, they raise so many of the cool sci-fi questions that excite me, like, um, if we send people out into space to go colonize another galaxy, what happens if we leapfrog them? Because, uh, and, you know, one, one of the crazy things that, you know, we, right now it might take us, you know, 500 years to get to our nearest, cell, you know, space system, uh, but what if we develop technology in the next 200 years to get there in 50? What if we develop technology in the next 150 years to get there in 5? Then the people would get there too late and their whole life's purpose will have been wasted. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know, imagine if we sent someone by boat, if boat took like 10 years to get there. Man, wait, is this impossible to do? I, this, this water right here is really giving me a hard time. It does not want to be removed at all. <laughs> this is why you need a thousand sponges. It's just for stubborn water like this. Uh, I think in reality, almost every time you get water this big, you want to subdivide it into sections. Like, you just, you have a much better time if you do that. But since we haven't done that today, uh, we're just going to keep powering through and seeing where it gets us. And it's apparently not very far. Uh, placing a lot of sponges down. I guess we could make, that, that might be a smart idea. What if we made big towers of sponges? so that the water couldn't flow through it. Yeah, we'll, we'll start from the bottom, kind of wastefully so, and stuck our way up to the top using dry sponges, not wet ones. So there we go. That can now be sponged around. And as long as it's close enough to a corner, it should stop some of the water from doing some of the crazy stuff it wants to do. Okay, there we go. We got all the way to the bottom now, by the way. We can see that there's a couple of things coming through here. We'll just sponge it away. <laughs> and now we just have to deal with the rest of this. This is a bizarre activity to do while building a biome, but it'll be so worth it when we have a space underneath it. I think the weirdest thing about water dynamics is because water slowly makes infinite sources from other ones, you kind of have to place sponges ridiculously fast, because if you don't, more water sources will spawn from it. To give an example, this water here, if I place one sponge there, the rest will kind of reform, but if I can place two sponges very quickly, that doesn't need to happen. There's a lot of weird things like that that stop you from just being able to drain 
drain an ocean by placing enough sponges. Although it would be fun to drain an entire ocean sometime. The one I have drained took so long that I've realized like, okay, you gotta, if you're doing any draining projects, keep it below a certain size or you'll go crazy. And indeed, uh, that is something that is starting to happen right now anyway. In, in real life, it is very hot and humid. I, uh, a lot of people don't understand why the UK gets to like 30 degrees and it's like swelching hot and like people start to die. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's slightly confusing that that can happen because in a lot of parts of the world, 30 degrees is just a nice day. I think the biggest factor that like, uh, you know, from, from traveling around the world that makes UK heat genuinely feel so much worse than elsewhere is if it gets humid on a hot day, it gets so bad. You get sweaty, it gets gross, it gets terrible, and every building is built to keep heat in because 99% of the year you don't need it. And I think it's kind of odd that that is hard. Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to kind of convey everything with temperature. Like when you, the objective units of measurement are really, really good for measuring some things. Like, uh, but it, it gets really tricky when you get to stuff like, how do you subjectively feel in hot weather? Bad. But, like, how bad? I don't know, like, way worse than I did before, I think. <laughs> and that's just kind of where I am right, right now. So, yeah, I, uh... I'm very hot as I'm recording this. I'm very wet hot. Like, I'm the type of hot where my whole body is covered in water. And so it's fun that I'm getting taunted by Minecraft water at the same time, is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, I'll be done very soon. So, uh, in your minds, though, look at me. There's all this water. And here I am now with just some bouncing around small salmon. I'm sorry. I, I love you as a Bedrock exclusive, but you're gonna have to die for the purpose of this beautiful room that we've now created. And so, uh, yeah, obviously, after picking up all of the wet sponges and eventually drying them off, uh, there's an obvious question of what am I gonna do with this brand new second biome I've created? I feel like you have to make like a secret cave going you, you can do all sorts of weird things with it But for now, I'm going to leave the choice not up to me But up to you leave me a comment down below of what you think this area should be and in a couple of weeks in the let's play We'll be going through that because I think next week. We're probably gonna be preparing for 1.20.30 There's a chance it comes out tomorrow, but I'm feeling like it's next week And uh, that is a kind of a big update that I think a lot of people have it, it's one of those things that's gonna be important so we might be preparing for that but the next time I'm in this world working on this thing uh, I will use your top comments one of them to decide what goes right here do you want to decide what's in the let's play world here is your opportunity except before actually I guess I need to make myself a way out of here let's make ourselves a lovely staircase out this wall right here it seems like the logical easy choice so stair 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 uh, and then, oh, actually, I, I see how this is going to cause me some problems. Wait, the one good piece of information about all of this wreckage, which I've now just about cleared as well as ended nexted, is I got three bones. You know what three bones can equal? That's right, nine bone meal. Me waiting and being cheap with my previous bone was actually quite smart, it seems. Also, I can't actually get out of here without having to fly, but I'll do that for now so we can show you this island, which is coming along quite nicely, but not as nicely as it could be. Boom, look at that, the flowers are good. Can we break them now? And then, yeah, we, so you just, you have to grow them manually and then later you can place them down, either on top of the same place they were sitting, or if you want, you could place it just anywhere else. For now though, I think it adds a little bit of charm to the island to have these uh, random patches of farmland, so I'll kind of leave them there. As I finish just some of this up, and you can see the second biome coming into full bloom because wow, look how smart and future planning I was. So we've got four biomes so far and now the highest effort of them all is going to come over there. I thought about this for a while because uh, the reason the cherry grove on top of mycelium biome really, I, I, I liked it, is because uh, Adorable Ho, who of course works uh, with me for the building team, uh, be because obviously seeing him uh, do this was like, wow, if you take the complementary, you know, like ground color and mix it with a complementary entry thing on top of it, you get something really, really nice. Both of these effects go together, even though you wouldn't normally see them like that. So what could I do to replace this last little section? And so I am brought all the way over to this part of my world to use a farm that I don't really feel like using very often. And uh, that's because a lot of people think having a neverwart farm on this scale is pointless. You only need a few neverwart to brew potions. And you know, is this many really ever going to come up as useful? The answer is yes. Having four stacks of neverwart is actually too few for what I want to do today. So we're going to obviously
honestly replant it like a good you know I be, being good to future yourself is very hard and making things future you problems is something we all love to do and that's why I have great t-shirts that say precisely that but I <laughs> I also think that even though making things future you's problem is something that's a great idea you can also do the exact opposite and help future you out where you can and uh, after we've paid back future us then we'll have our you know we could pay it back all the way or we could just put like some of this down I think I no I didn't want to start a raid Okay, so let's get out of that and let's uh, make that future us problem. Well, you know, what? we're already doing one thing for future us He can he can do one thing back So let's go ahead make some never warp blocks and then fly away before that becomes a problem I have to deal with that is why you probably shouldn't kill pillager raids every time you see them I just think to myself I'm at some point I need to repair this shovel and I'm gonna probably use villagers wouldn't it be handy to use that but yeah anyway I've got some never warp blocks. I'm gonna have to obviously find some more though, which obviously is best done in the never Specifically, the Crimson Forest. Or, if you're me, a giant sky height salt sand farm. You know, sometimes, sometimes gas come and get you and you don't expect it, okay? But, um, yeah, this is another way that I can pick up some Never War. Honestly, I think at this point it makes sense to make, like, an even larger scale version of uh, one of these farms, which we'll find out as we start placing these never warp blocks down right here. This is definitely going to be also not just the highest effort, but also the highest variance of a biome, I would say, right? Like, I mean, you are changing something that is a very standard, typical thing into bright blood red. You could do a lower effort version with Nevrak, but again, I want to try the exact same idea and I want to see if it works. Can we take an existing uh, biome and can we make it something much prettier by taking some red in the form of the Never want to be the base of it, and then building on top of this using some mangrove logs. I also have for the leaves some dark oak leaves. I feel like, you know, if we're going to build our own trees, we might as well mix up the leaf and tree type, and let's try precisely that right now. The log is going to be red, and it's going to kind of function like an oak tree, but instead of regular oak leaves, it's going to be dark oak. Is that a better fit? I don't know. I just happen to have a ton of dark oak leaves lying around, and I think it'd be a good fit for precisely what we're doing right here. So we'll build a bunch of these leaves around here, as I believe trees look like, and then we we place like a whole second layer up here and then if I'm not mistaken you, you build like a cross on top of that and that is roughly what a tree looks like and honestly you might think that it doesn't go so well together like well this is red but that's brown and that's green but what about if we strip the log now all of a sudden we've got ourselves a very red tree for the biome and then the green leaves are just the kind of like offset to that I like it quite a bit actually I um I, I think it is worth maybe us going for just a different couple types of trees first so let's expand this biome quite a bit using all of the Never what blocks I could find in my world, and uh, let's see where that takes us. The answer is not very far, but that still is not going to stop me from trying to build a couple more types of trees. So I guess we should logically go for the dark oak tree, even though uh, I think it's going to be the least logical for this fit of a biome for a cute airy one. It might be the best fit because the leaves are actually correct. Um, building dark oak trees is surprisingly hard, I think. you got to like go way further out than you want to on your first layer, and then you have to go way higher up than you want to. There are a lot of leaves that are involved, so we'll just kind of build like a, a lower rent version version if we can. Um, it goes at least too wide for all the first set and then after that things are a little bit less fussy I think. So now we go up here and then just generally have like a bunch of blocks like so. That is my dark oak tree. It just looks like a fat oak tree if we're being honest. But then we can obviously shear this one too and I'm kind of liking that and now we have one more thing to try here which is I think to try the savannah tree. We have savannah trees chilling around here anyway, so we just place some blocks up, place a leaf, which we hopefully have enough of. 36, maybe. You know what? 36 is fine. And then we'll place another one, and then we'll place another one, and then if we wanted to, we can kind of go back the other way and be kind of quirky about that. Yeah, that, actually, yeah, that's a good idea. There we go. Boom. Now we can then connect this into one overarching big branch, and uh, on savannah trees, as you can see, there is kind of like a second layer to this we have to go for, so... Uh, the second layer. I guess the first layer goes out way wider than I'm thinking. So then the second layer can go up like this. And then that is literally all my leaves besides two. So we just kind of casually shear these. If we, I better have my mending shears on me. If I don't, Oh, look at that. I think I left them in the dispenser, actually, all that time ago. Okay, well, there we go. We just remove the errant pieces and we use the last two blocks to go 
I don't know, like right over there. And boom, this is my, wait, actually, not yet. It's, it's not red yet, it's not properly red. This is my red tree for the red biome. I do think the standard oak looks best, but that might be because of my poor understanding of how to build <laughs> a dark oak tree or a savanna one. Uh, but do you like this biome? This is the question. Out of these five biomes, you can see if you were going on a large scale, which ones would be easiest and least easy. We have easiest, second easiest, Third easiest, because of the, you know, the deepness into the game you need to get to. Then fourth and fifth. Which of these is actually the best? And most importantly, if you're going to have five biomes, it's important to actually have something go in the middle. So, even though I put my deep slate away, I think we're going to have to go and bring it back, because I have an idea. By the way, this week, so many people have been commenting on the most recent Q&A SAS day, saying various things about, uh, you know, Mojang, and kind of confirming my point that, like, you know, if you are, like, this reliant on a game developer for your happiness, and the game developer isn't delivering, uh, then just like anything else in life, if you are reliant on something deeply, uh, and that, or if you you're, you have something that is deeply not working for you, being reliant on it isn't a good idea. And I know that's so much easier said than done. It's so much easier to complain about things than actually fix them. But I think the, the, the lesson that really has resonated with a surprising number of people is this thing about, yeah, Actually, you do need to uh, consider at some point that when you are reliant on others, you are inherently creating an unstable system where at some point you might be let down. And so um, I think that the, uh, you know, th this is true for like friends. If you rely on a friend so desperately for something, it's terrible. If you rely on every time something goes wrong, there is someone you call and you, you make sure they get it right. It, the one day they're not going to call and you're not going to get it right, you're going to be quite horrified of the situation. It's going to be like, but why, why couldn't you help me out? It was the time I needed it most. And so, um, you know, I, I feel like uh, the lesson I've learned most from, like, honestly, my childhood is, like, relying on other people really puts people out of shape. Or, you know, even if the... Also, oh, is this... I think this is going to be my head. So we got, like, two eyes for it. And then the rest will look like this. And then we just have to do some arms now. And then a tail back here. Uh, can you guess what it is from the fact that it has arms, eyes, and a tail? That's right. It's a totem of undying. Yep, that's what I wanted it to be. It was, it's a totem undying with a tail because it's a cat. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> you ever mess something up so bad you accidentally build something else? I think uh, not being reliant on things is a really valuable uh, message uh, for a lot of people uh, probably to learn because ultimately, um, even, you know, even though I mentioned in this video, like, yeah, there are so many things that it's so much easier to have someone else do, knowing what value people are bringing to you will make you appreciate the world so much more than when you just assume someone is doing something for me and they're doing a bad job and so my day is worse. When you have a bad job and your own day is ruined and there's no one to complain to, you, you feel so much more about, like, you, you start to understand so much more like, oh... This is how, this is what happens to other people all the time. And, uh, wow, that must suck for them. Uh, maybe, maybe it's just a lesson in empathy. Maybe it's not, though. Either way, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. I am going to actually make this one have a black stem, just for sole curiosity on how it looks. Um, don't forget to uh, consider, uh, you know, becoming a channel member if you really enjoy uh, these longer Let's Plays. And indeed, the live streams on this channel. It's been a wild... Uh, time, but I am doing my best uh, here on the YouTube game, and all of your support is massively appreciated to help things stay around. Thank you for in doing that. Thank you for existing, and uh, well, actually not thank me for existing, but thank you for existing uh, as well, so that you may thank me for existing, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>